I want to make a statement again and let me assure you that it's not a pious platitude, but a very sincere statement. When I come to the eighth chapter of Romans, this is how I felt all the way through this epistle, but especially here. I feel totally incapable of dealing with these great truths. And you may be sure of one thing that will not deal with them adequately as we have not all the way through. This is such a glorious and wonderful epistle that all we can do is just stand as Moses did at the burning bush with our feet unshod, our head uncovered, not realizing or recognizing the glory and wonder of it all. We've come to the conclusion of this matter of sanctification. In fact, we have in this chapter three great subjects, sanctification, security, and no separation from God. We come now to powerful sanctification in contrast with powerless sanctification, and in this chapter, we're going to see God's new provision for our sanctification. That will be the first 39 verses that we have here. And you have the new law that's given, the Holy Spirit versus law that's in the first four verses. This is definitely the high water mark in Romans and probably the Bible. Spencer made this statement, quoting, If Holy Scripture were a ring, and the epistle to the Romans, its precious stone, chapter 8 would be the sparkling point of the jewel. That's the end of the quotation. That's a wonderful statement, is it not? Godet labeled this chapter, this incomparable chapter. Someone else has added this statement. We enter this chapter with no condemnation. We close this chapter with no separation. And in between, all things work together for good to those that love God. And friends, I'd like to add this. How could you have it any better than that? You've got the whole ball of wax here. And we find that there is to be given to the child of God in this life joy and peace. He's to live for God in the very presence of sin. Sin is not to dictate his life's program. He's already been shown that there's nothing in the justified sinner that can produce this ideal state. It was shown in chapter 7 that even the new nature had no power and the old nature had no good. So how in the world is a child of God to live for God? And Paul cried out for outside help. He said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? from the power of this death. May I say to you, this was Paul's water gate. Chapter 7. Who's going to enable me to live for God was his cry. How am I to do it? Someone has put it like this, run, run, and do the law commands, but gives me neither feet nor hands. Better news the gospel brings, it bids me fly, and it gives me wings. Now, Paul said last time, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. This is a great chapter we're in now. And we've seen at the beginning in the first three chapters, it was God the Father in creation. And then in chapter 3, verse 21 through the seventh chapter, it is God the Son, salvation. Now in this chapter, it's God the Holy Spirit and real sanctification. We haven't had very much mention about the Holy Spirit, only two casual references, but now in this chapter, he's mentioned 19 times. So apparently we've come to something that's very new, and that means that you and I, if we're to work down here a life, that is well-pleasing to God, it must be in the power of the Holy Spirit. And as Paul said to the Ephesians, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Ephesians 5, 18. Now, sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit in the regenerated life of a believer, delivering the believer from the power of sin, even in the very presence of sin and performing all God's will in the life of the believer. And we're now brought into this glorious, wonderful relationship. Will you notice as we get into this chapter, we have here, as Godet has labeled these first few verses, victory of the Holy Spirit over sin and death. And I'm reading now the text. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, does not really belong to this verse. Apparently, some scribe added this, and he picked it up from verse 4, for that's where it belongs, and does not belong here. Let me give you my translation now of this verse. Therefore now, not one condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Not one condemnation. Now we have here the very inspired statement that in spite of the failure that Paul experienced in chapter 7, he didn't lose his salvation. There's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. He just wasn't enjoying the Christian life. It was a failure. He was a failure. That was the problem, and he was a wretched man, and God wanted joy in his life. Now, how is he to have this? Well, we find verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. This is another very important statement, and we find here this little word for, F-O-R. It occurs 17 times in this chapter. It's the cement that holds this chapter together. And it is a word that requires real mental effort. We need to follow the logic of the Apostle Paul, as we said before. It was one of the great expositors of Romans who made this statement that if you do not find Paul logical, well, you're not reading him aright. After all, he makes it clear. And the law here of the Spirit means not only a principle of law, but also the authority which is exercised by the Spirit. The Spirit of life means the Holy Spirit brings life because He essentially is life. He is the Spirit of life. And it's Christ Jesus means that the Holy Spirit is in complete union with Christ Jesus because the believer shares the life of Christ. He liberates the believer. Now the law of sin and death, that's the authority that sin had over our old nature, ending in complete severance of fellowship with God. Now that new nature could not break the shackles at all. Only the coming of a higher authority and power could accomplish this, namely the Holy Spirit, and operating upon the new nature, which is vitally now joined to the life of Christ, the man in the seventh chapter who was joined to the body of the dead is now joined to the living Christ also. Now listen to verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Let me give you my translation, and I think it'll bring out several things that we need to understand because this is the crux of the whole matter. Listen very carefully. For the thing impossible for the law in which it was powerless through the flesh, God having sent his own Son, in the likeness of the flesh of sin. And in regard to sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the justification, that is the righteous result of the law, might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That was impossible for the law to produce righteousness in man. And this is not the fault of the law. The fault is in man, and the sin 
in his flesh. The law was totally incapable of producing any good thing in man. Paul could say, I know that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And friend, that's scripture. That's what the Bible is saying. And that's accurate. That's true of you. It's true of me. And this was because man was totally sinful. Man is totally depraved. Now, that doesn't mean the man across the street or down in the next block from you, or it doesn't mean some person that's living in overt sin. It means you and me. The Holy Spirit is now able to do the impossible. The Holy Spirit can produce a holy life in weak and sinful flesh. Now, I know but one way of illustrating this and of making it clear to us, and that's by using a very homely illustration, and it's that of a housewife. She goes to the butcher shop. She gets a roast, and after breakfast, she puts that roast in the oven because they're going to have it for the noon meal. And she gets busy in the kitchen when she puts it in the oven, and the telephone rings. She goes to the telephone, and it's Mrs. Joe Dokes on the telephone. And Mrs. Joe Dokes begins by saying, have you heard? Well, she hasn't heard, but she'd like to. And she pulls up a chair. Someone has defined a woman as one who draws up a chair when answering a telephone. And so she gets on the telephone and Mrs. Joe Dokes really has something to talk about. She talks about the preacher and she talks about the different members of the church and she talks about everybody else, and she includes a little politics. So she has a lot to say. And about an hour goes by, and finally this good housewife says, Oh, Miss Dokes, you'll have to excuse me. I smell the roast in the stove burning, and I'm going to have to get it out. And it was burning, by the way. She hangs up the phone, rushes into the kitchen. There's smoke in the kitchen now because that roast is burning. She opens the oven and she gets a fork. She puts it down in the roast to lift it up and it won't hold. She can't lift it out. And she tries it again closer to the bone and it still won't hold. And she's a good housewife. And so now she goes and gets a spatula. She puts that spatula under the roast and now she lifts it out. You see what the fork could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Now the spatula is able to do. There was nothing wrong with the fork. It was a good fork. But you see, it couldn't hold the flesh. There was something wrong with the flesh. It's been overcooked. And there has been introduced now something new. The spatula does what the fork can't do. May I say to you, the law is like the fork in that what the law could not do, it's weak through the flesh. It just won't lift us up. It can't lift us up. But now a new principle is introduced. It's the Holy Spirit. And what the law couldn't do, the Holy Spirit's able to do. Therefore, you and I today are to live the Christian life on the new principle. And it's not this principle of trying to get ourselves by our bootstraps and lifting us up. We'll never make it, friends. And all this business of making resolutions and saying I'm going to do better, all of us have said that. But did we ever do better? The same old thing, didn't we do that? God is able to do this new and impossible thing by sending his very own son, his own nature in the likeness of flesh of sin. Christ had the same kind of flesh that we have apart from sin. Will you notice here that the Word of God has to say in Hebrews 2, verse 14, For as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Now again in Hebrews 7, 26, 
for such an high priest become us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. And again in Hebrews 10, 5, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not but a body hast thou prepared me. This was God's way of getting at the roots of sin in our bodies, in our minds, in our spirits. He could come down and execute sinful flesh on the cross so that it had no more rights in human beings. God was able to deal with sin itself. Christ was identified with us. Oh, what condensation that is, friends. Sin has been condemned in these bodies of ours. It has not been removed in spite of the belief of some very sincere people. These bodies are to be redeemed, raised as spiritual bodies, and the Holy Spirit is the deliverer from sin in the body. A great many people think, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if Christ would come and take us out of this world of sin? And I want to say, friends, that would be wonderful, and I wish it would happen right now. And I want to say that there's something more wonderful than that, and that is to enable you and me to live the Christian life right where you and I are today in a world of sin. That's more wonderful. And in John 17, 15, in his high priestly prayer, he said, I don't pray to take them out of the world. I pray that you keep them in the world. My friend, that's the important thing, and that's where the victory is down here. And that's what he wants to do. Now he says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled. This is the passive voice, which means that the Holy Spirit produces a life of obedience which the law commanded but could not produce. The Holy Spirit furnishes the power. The decision is ours, for sin shall not have dominion over us. What a wonderful, glorious thing that is. Now notice here, we have a new struggle. It's now not for us to do the fighting. It's the Holy Spirit versus the flesh. Listen to this. For they that are after are in the flesh according to the flesh. They mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. That's verse 5. In other words, they that are after the flesh, they'll mind the things of the flesh. Now that means they obey the things of the flesh. I was holding a meeting in Middle Tennessee when I was first ordained. I was having dinner in a lovely country home, and the housewife had cooked up some wonderful fried chicken. We were sitting at the table. She went out to call her little boy, and she came back in after she called him several times, and she says, that young one won't mind me. And what she meant was, that young one won't obey me. Paul, you see, was actually a good southerner because he uses this word, they mind the things, they obey the things of the flesh. And now we've seen that before in the sixth chapter of Romans. This idea today of a Christian saying, well, I just have to do this, I live in the flesh. My friend, if you live in the flesh and obey the things of the flesh all the time and the new nature doesn't rebuke you, you must not have a new nature because... They that are after the Spirit, they'll mind the things of the Spirit. And you've been given a new nature, and now you can yield yourself to the new nature. And that's an act of the will. And this is the new struggle that's brought to our attention. Now, this is the same thing the Lord Jesus said when he said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. It'll always be flesh. God has no program to change the flesh. He brings in something new, but that is born of the Spirit is Spirit. That's something else. Now, a new struggle is brought to our attention. It's no longer the new nature or the believer striving for master over sin in the body. It's the Holy Spirit striving against the old nature. The little boy was coming home from school. He was being beaten up by a big bully, and he was on the bottom, and the big bully pounding him very heavily. And he looked up from his defeated position at the bottom and he saw his big brother coming. The big brother took care of the bully. 
while the little fella crawled up on the stump and rubbed his bruises. The believer has the Holy Spirit to deal with the flesh, that big bully. I can't overcome it. I learned that long time ago, so I have to turn it over to somebody who can, and the Holy Spirit indwells believers, and he wants to do that for us, and he can. Paul sets before us in this verse two diametrically opposed ways of living. No, two could be more radically different. Those according to the flesh, that's the natural man, and Paul paints his picture over in Ephesians, the second chapter. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in the time past you walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power there, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And you had your conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That was the condition of all of us till we were saved. And the flesh includes the mind here as we've seen. And you that are sometimes alienated and enemies, your mind by wicked works, but now hath he reconciled. That's Colossians 1.21. And it includes the total person which is completely alienated from God. Now you see this class seeks, strives, and even sets their hearts upon the things of the flesh. They don't receive it. It's foolishness to them. And that's their diet. It's the works of the flesh are manifest. And you can find that in Galatians 5, 19 and 20. It's an ugly brood. And in Colossians, he says, it's anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication. That's the thing the Lord Jesus said, out of the mouth proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, and all of that ugly brood. It's humiliating, but true that the child of God retains this old Adamic nature, and it means defeat and death to live by the flesh. No child of God can be happy in living for the things of the flesh. The prodigal son may get in the pig pen, but he'll never be content to stay there. He's bound to say, I will arise and go to my Father. Now, those that are according to the Spirit mean they're born again, regenerated, indwelt by the Spirit of God, and they love the things of God. If then ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And again, he says in Colossians, put on therefore as the elect of God, Holy and beloved, tender mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Now, these are just some of the things. These are the things for which the child of God strives, and you and I can't get it by effort. It's only as we let the Spirit of God work in our lives. Now, he says in verse 6, and these are great principles here, listen. For to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, the mind of the flesh is death. That means simply this. It means that you're separated from fellowship with God, and that flesh is death here and now. Now, the Spirit indwells the believer, and he brings life and peace. And you'll notice death means separation from God and all that implies. When you and I sin, we're to confess our sin and be brought into fellowship. Let him wash us. The life he offers speaks of full satisfaction, the exercise of one's total abilities. Oh, to live life at its fullest and best. A lot of people think they're living today. They're not living at all. Peace means you're to experience tranquility and well-being regarding the present and the future. Oh, my beloved, how you and I need to get into that territory we can experience peace. Now, there's one thing for sure, that if you are living in the flesh and you are a child of God, you are not having fellowship with God. You can't. The Lord Jesus in the upper room said to Simon Peter, if I wash you not, you have no part with me. Now, friends, he meant that. He'll not fellowship with you or with me if we are permitting sin in our lives and continue to live in the flesh. 
Well, somebody says what we're to do. Do what Simon Peter had to do. Stuck out his feet and let the Lord wash them. And you and I need to go to him in confession. If we confess our sins, we, who's we? We Christian. He is faithful and just when he does it because it'll take the blood of Christ, my friend. You and I do not know how wicked that old nature is. And we need to go to him. And as Donnie said years ago, Lord, I confess that thou alone art able to purify this Augean stable, be the sea's water and all the land's soap. Yet if thy blood not wash me, there's no hope. And John says in 1 John again, that first chapter, he says the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, keeps on cleansing us from all sin. You and I can imagine this soul nature we have is totally depraved. God has no plan to redeem it. He gives us a new nature. And you and I can't live for God in that old nature. If you continue to live in that old nature, must not be a child of God. Somebody says then, if a child of God sins, What's the difference between him and the lost man? The difference is simply this. The lost man goes out at night and he paints the town red and he comes in and he says, I'll get a bigger brush and a bigger bucket of paint next time. Wow, he says, I want to live it up. The child of God will come in if he does a thing like that and he'll cry out to God, oh God, I hate myself. And you'll hate that old nature you got. And this idea today that you can somehow or another train it and live in it, you cannot, my friend. And that's the thing that leads to these legalists today that are, well, I call them Priscilla good bodies and goody, goody gumdrops. All oh, those sweet, lovely people that are trying today to control the flesh and they're so pious. And I want to tell you they're the worst gossips you've ever met. Dr. Newell has put down some very interesting statements. I'd like to pass them on to you. To hope to be better is to fail to see yourself in Christ only. This idea, oh, I hope to do better. Well, you know you're not. You need to see yourself in Christ today and that only the Spirit of God can move through you. And then he says again, to be disappointed with yourself, that means you believed in yourself. Somebody says, oh, I'm so disappointed in myself. Well, you better be disappointed in yourself. No good thing's going to come out of that flesh, friend. Stop believing in yourself and believe that the Spirit of God today can enable you through the new nature to live for God. And then, may I say, to be discouraged, that's unbelief. Somebody says, oh, I'm so discouraged. Why, my friend, that means you don't believe God. God has a purpose and a plan, a blessing for you, and you need to lay hold of it. And to be proud is to be blind. We have no standing before God in ourselves. Oh, my friend, to see yourself as God sees you. Miss Mel tried to put it, if we could see ourselves as God sees us, we couldn't stand ourselves. That's how bad we are. And the lack of divine blessing, my friend, it comes from unbelief and not a failure of devotion. I get so tired of these dedicated Christians today. And believe me, friends, I am sick and weary of these super-duper pious, dedicated Christians. They talk about that. My friend, the lack of divine blessing comes because we do not believe God it's not because of a lack of devotion. Oh, to believe God today. Now, real devotion to God arises not from man's will to show it, but from the discovery that blessing has been received from God while we were yet unworthy and undevoted. Anything I get from God does not come through my devotion. I have anything to offer him. It comes because of his marvelous grace. And this idea to preach devotion today. And I've seen these folk troop down to dedicate their lives and services. And I got so sick and tired of seeing that same crowd come down. And that same crowd, you could not trust them, my friend. You could not trust them. 
They were liars. They were dishonest and gossips, and they'll crucify you. May I say to you, you do not need to dedicate yourself. What you need today is to believe God can do something and you can't do anything. Now, somebody says that's pretty strong. I hope that it is. I intend for it to be that way because Paul is making it very clear here. The carnal mind is enmity against God. Listen to him in verses 7 and 8. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You and I have an old nature, and that old nature is a spiritual communist. And this demolishes, I think, any theory that there's a divine spark in man and that somehow or other he has a secret bent for God. The truth is that man is the enemy of God. He's not only dead in trespasses and sins, but he's active in rebellion against God. Now, he'll even become religious in order to stay away from the living and true God in the person of Christ. Man in his natural condition, if taken to heaven, would start a revolution and he'd have a protest meeting going on before the sun went down. Jacob, in his natural condition, engaged in a wrestling match. He did not seek it, and he fought back when God wrestled with him. And it wasn't until he yielded, it wasn't until he turned it over that he won, my friend. Anything that the flesh produces is not acceptable to God. The so-called do-gooder today, the civilization, the culture, man's vaunted progress, all are a stench in the nostrils of God. The religious work of church people done in lukewarmness of the flesh make Christ ill at heart. I wonder if we are willing to accept God's estimation of our human boasting. My friend, this is a terrible picture of man but it's accurate. But there is deliverance in the Spirit of God. And are you willing, friend, are you willing to turn it over to the Spirit of God and quit trusting that weak, sinful nature that you have? That's the question. Now I come to verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Now, this if here, this first if, is actually not in the original. Paul is not casting a doubt over the Roman salvation. They are saved. But what he's saying, and let me give you my translation, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God really dwells in you. That's the real test. But if anyone has not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of you. That's the text. And Paul could even say to the Corinthians, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which ye have of God and you're not your own? That's 1 Corinthians 6, 19. And when Paul went over to Ephesus that first time and these people were saying they were Christians, he missed something. He asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Not after, but when you believed. And they said, we don't even know what you're talking about. He said, then what was your baptism? It was unto John. And John's baptism was just a to repentance. It was not to faith in Jesus Christ. And he began to preach Christ to them. Then they received the Holy Spirit, my friend. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creation. And that's the real test today. Do you love him? Do you want to serve him? Is that the thing that's in your mind and heart? Are you in rebellion against God? Now, it's wonderful to know that the Spirit of God is there to help us. Verse 10, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Again, let me read this. In my translation, now if Christ be in you, the body indeed 
is dead because of or on the count of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. What he's saying here is this, that you and I are in Christ. And when we're in Christ, it means that when he died, we die. And we are to reckon on that. We've already been told that. And we're to yield, that is, present our bodies. And again, this idea of saying, oh, I can't, I've tried, and all that type of talk today, that's not the language of a believer today. We're to turn this over to Christ. And Paul could say, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me the life I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And I think a believer today, if you are not conscious of the presence of the Spirit of God in your life, and that you have a desire to want to serve God, then you do well to do what Paul says. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? That's 2 Corinthians 13, 5. And the Lord wants us to know to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, his last invitation is, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I'll come in to him. Is the door open? Has he come in to you? My friend, the body has been put in the place of death. And that is something the child of God should reckon on and should turn his life over to the Spirit of God. And to say very definitely, I can't do it, Lord, but you can do it through me. Now, verse 11, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal bodies by Spirit that dwelleth in you. We are going to see a little later on in this epistle that you and I have this old body is going to be put in the grave one of these days if the Lord tarry, but it's going to be raised in newness of life. And that actually we groan today in these old bodies of ours. But the indwelling Holy Spirit is the assurance that our bodies will be raised from the dead. He was raised from the dead. And we are to be raised from the dead. And the Holy Spirit will deliver us from the body of this death. That's this old nature. It should be put in the place of death. Now he says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. In other words, we are not to live after the flesh. And God has created man today. He created him body, mind, and spirit. And when man sinned, his spirit died immediately. But the Lord said, in the day ye eat thereof, you'll die. Now, actually, Adam didn't die till 900 and some odd years later, physically. But he died spiritually, that is, Death means separation from God. And actually, man was turned upside down, and the body became dominant, and the old nature became dominant, the flesh, and man is dead spiritually. Now, regeneration means you're turned right side up, that you're born again spiritually, and you have a nature that today wants to serve God. Oh, my friend, to stay close to Christ today. That's the important thing. These people that are so active today in churches, this is termites, and Christ is a million miles from them. He's in outer space as far as they're concerned. And this old nature of ours, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, Paul says in verse 12. You don't have to do it. Now, the natural man, he tells you, we got to eat. He owes it to his flesh to satisfy it. I hear that on every hand today. A movie star said, I live for sex. He satisfies nature. And he says, I have to have my needs met. You hear that on every hand today. And it's plunged us in the grossest immorality. My friends, the flesh is a low-down, dirty rascal. 
And all of us have got that rascal, by the way. Now, verse 13, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. That is, you die to God. No fellowship with him. You know this. I'm not talking about a theory today. If you are a child of God, when you sin, what do you do? Do you want to go to a prayer meeting? Do you want to go to church? Do you want to read the Bible? Do you want to pray? Of course you don't. You're in a state and you're separated from God. But if you're through the Spirit, you can't do it yourself. Mortify the deeds of the body you shall live. Now, what is your problem today? What's your hang? Let's be practical. Let's get down to the nitty-gritty and deal with this thing in reality. What is your hang? Drink? Oh, you say I don't drink. Drugs? Not yours? How about sex? Oh, somebody says, oh, no. Well, what do you think about it? What about your thought life? How about your gossip? Do you tell the truth? Then why don't you go to God today and confess these things? Turn it over to the Holy Spirit. Why don't you deal with it in reality today and stay off of the psychiatrist's couch? He won't help you. He can ship your guilt complex to another area. Can't get rid of it. <laughs> you got it, friend. And only Christ can remove it. He's in that business today. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll rest you. You know what it is to have sins forgiven. That's what he's talking about here. I'd love to dwell on this, but I have to move on. Now we come to this new section here, beginning of verse 14. And you have here the new man, the son of God, and you have the Holy Spirit and the spirit of man. Now we're told, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. That makes sense, does it not? God doesn't drive his sheep. He leads them. You remember when our Lord told of the safety and security of the sheep, he made it clear that they are not forced into the will of his hand and that of his father. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and I drive them out. Oh, no, <laughs> they follow me. They are the ones that are safe and secure, friend. They follow him. They are led by the Spirit of God, and they follow him. They hear his voice. They've got a new nature. I found out in preaching a long time ago as a pastor. I've always tried to preach the Word of God, and I found out that those that are his sheep, they hear his voice. And the others, oh, boy, do they hate you. <laughs> And will they fight you? You know why? They're not his sheep. You give out his word. He said that. He says, now the world hated me. They're going to hate you. Now, if you're a friend of the world, something's wrong. The pastor came to me, young man. He said, I'm having all kinds of trouble. I said, what kind of trouble? Well, I said, with my officers, Sunday school teachers. And I said, what's the problem? He said, well, I've been teaching the Bible. I've been trying to follow you through the Bible course. I said, well, thank God. I said, you're going to find out that there are a lot of them not his sheep. His sheep will follow him, friends. They just have to because they're his sheep, you see. And that's what he's saying here. Now he says here, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry of the Father. There's not that spirit of fear within you, wondering about your spiritual condition and unhappy and despondent while you're filled with joy. You're now his child. And the spirit of God just wells up in you and says, Abba, Father. Now, that word Abba was never translated. The translators at the beginning who had great reverence for the word of God, who believed it was the word of God, they wouldn't translate it. I'm told that it's very personal. It could be translated, my daddy. And my friends, you don't talk about God like that, do you? I know there are a lot of them today getting very familiar, but that's blasphemy. We don't do that. But the Spirit of God within us, and I think it's in time of trouble especially. I found this true when I went to hospital. I turned my face to the wall just like old Hezekiah did, and I said, Lord, I've been in this hospital many, many times, and I've patted the hands of folk and had prayer with them and then just told them, Oh, you trust the Lord, he'll see you through. I said, Lord, I've told them that, but this is the first time I've been here. I want to know whether it's true or not. I want you to make it real to me. If you're my father, I want to know it. And I know it, friend. 
He'll make it real to you. He cries out, Abba, Father, just wells up within you. He's my Father. And you just commit yourself to him. And how sweet it is to trust him. Oh, how I'd love to talk about that also. Now he says, and if children then, heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. I think it's since we suffer with him. I think that the if there's not near as big as it's been made. I think that actually it just means here, what are you enduring today? Well, Paul makes it clear elsewhere that this is just a light thing we're going through now. But there's a weighty thing, an eternal weight of glory that's coming someday. And I think a great many of us, when we get in eternity, will wish that we had suffered a little bit more for him because that's the way he schools us and trains us and whom the Lord loved it, he disciplines. And that's his method. Some of God's dear children are going through a great deal today. Now, we come to a new division in this eighth chapter. New creation is the theme here. The old versus the new. Bondage versus liberty. That is verses 18 through 22. Now, everything is new in this chapter, as we've said before, and that's important to see, by the way. We've had the new law, the new struggle, the new man, and the new creation, the new body, the new purpose of God, and the new security of the believer. All things have become new any man's in Christ Jesus. And that's who we've been talking about. Now, not only the bodies of believers are to be redeemed, but we're going to find out that this entire physical universe, this earth that you and I live in, is to be redeemed. That is the purpose of God, and he's going to bring on, in fact, we're trading in this old earth for a new earth, for a new model, brand new wherein there'll be no sin, no curse of sin upon it, and it'll never come upon it again. And that is something that's quite wonderful. Someone said to me not long ago when we were in the book of Acts, they said, well, I believe that healing is in the atonement. I think I shocked the person. I said, I believe that too. And I said, not only is healing in the atonement, but a new body is in the atonement, and a new world is in the atonement of Christ. But we don't have it yet. I don't have the new world yet, although the political parties in the United Nations have been bringing it in for years, but we just don't seem to have it yet. But Christ is going to bring it in someday through his redemption. And then I'm going to get a new body. I'm looking forward to that. This one I've got is wearing out. And I want to trade it in for a new one. And that's coming. And healing, I grant that, that it's there. But I don't have all of that yet. I still have cancer. But he lets me live. And that's a thorn in the flesh. But if Paul could have a thorn in the flesh, I don't see why Vernon McGee shouldn't have one. And I rejoice today in the goodness and the grace of God, my friends. Now let's look at this, if you don't mind. I'm reading verse 18. Paul says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, here's that word, I reckon, again. The only people that use that term, I reckon, are those who come from Texas and the states that join Texas. This is a good word, by the way. Good Bible word. Paul used it, as I've said before. Paul was a Southern, and I even know where he came from, the state. He's a Texan. I reckon, he says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory about to be revealed upon and in us. Now, we are going to get some redeemed bodies someday. And as I've suggested, it'd be nice to trade in an old body for a new one. So in a natural body, it's going to be raised a spiritual body. It's going to be a body. I feel very naked without a body, friends. I always functioned in a body. It's been my house I've been living in. And I 
wouldn't know what to do without it. And although Paul's made it very clear that the old nature had control of this old body of ours and has control of it. Psychology has a great deal to talk about the habits. You know that you do certain things, think certain things, and it sets up in these old bodies these neurons, axons, and dendrites. It just makes a freeway. And some of us have had quite a freeway in the past of the old nature and sin. And it's mighty hard to reroute. When the new nature takes over, he has to make a new route because he's not going to let you live in sin. That new nature won't sin. If you sin, Paul made it very clear, what I would, well, I don't do it. (laughs) That old nature won't bud. And he has trouble. And that's what Paul now is talking about here. We're going to get a new body. The glory that's to be revealed in us. Now, will you listen to him? He says, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, let me give you my translation here. For the creation watching with outstretched head, that is head erect, is waiting or sighing for the revelation of the sons of God. Now, the world's not waiting for the sunrise of evolution's pipe dream, uh, in spite of the fact that you sometimes hear a solo squealing at the top of her or his voice about the world is waiting for the sunrise. But it's not. The pipe dream of evolution will never come true. Today, though, the creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And when the sons of God have removed the outward covering of this flesh, creation's going to be unveiled also. What a day that will be. Now we are told here in verse 20, and I'll read my translation here. For the creation was subjected to vanity. Vanity here means failure, decayed, perishable. Not of its own will, but by reason of him who subjected it on the basis of hope. Remember, The writer Solomon, he was quite a pessimist, by the way. He said, by the rivers run into the sea, the sea's not full. It has no end because what happens is the Lord has quite a pump, a hydraulic pump, pumps the water up out of the ocean, and then he has a good transportation system that the wind moves the clouds across in the dry land, and here comes the rain again, fills the river, rivers run into the sea, never fail. There's sort of a monotony about nature today, and you can't go anywhere but what you don't discover that. Actually, nature's waiting for that manifestation and waiting for that unveiling. And we're told here, for the creation was subjected to vanity because God did it that way. The curse of sin came upon man in Adam's disobedience, but the physical world also came under the curse. God said, you remember to him, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. I enjoy going out to the Hawaiian Islands. I know of no place that is quite as delightful as that. I agree with the publicity out there that calls this paradise. That is paradise. But I am very much interested in paradise that Of all the places where I found thorns, it's down at the golf course at Mauna Kea. Knock a ball out in the rough there. It's out in the lava. And you go out there, and I have never seen as many thorns as they are. I've got a pair of shoes that have thorns in them to this good day. I can't get them all out. Even in the place that's paradise today, The thorn is there. Thorns and thistles, God says it'll grow. All you have to do is just look around. Now, there's a curse on creation. And the word here, vanity, means it's empty. It's meaningless, resultless. Nature never seems to accomplish some great purpose, that weary round of repetition. Let me just share a little of that with you. Ecclesiastes, first chapter, verse 5. The sun also ariseth, sun goeth down, hasteth to its place where it arose. Got to do it all over the next day. The wind goeth toward the south, turneth unto the north. 
blows well in Texas, where I live. They used to say that in the summertime, all of Texas blew across the Red River into Oklahoma, became Oklahoma. And then in wintertime, the blue northers would come, and then Oklahoma blew back into Texas across the river. Pretty monotonous, by the way. And I want to tell you, I never did like those sandstorms. And then again, all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea's not full. Under the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. All things are full of labor. Man can not utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. That's the thing about these old natures you and I got. Never satisfied. Don't care how much you hear or how much you see. You want to hear some more and see some more. Nature had this happen to it, not willingly. It was because of the sin of man and because of the creature. Listen to him now, verse 21. Because the creation or creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. Now, there is that curse that's on nature today. Man has a dying body. Someone has said the moment that gives us life begins to take it away from us. And there's decay and death out under nature. Go out in the beautiful forest. Then you see that tree lying there, dead, corrupt, rotting out. That's nature. And the stench of the putrid bodies of dead animals will fill the atmosphere. Now, listen to Paul in verse 22. For we know that the whole creation is groaning and is suffering birth pangs together until now. Will you notice this? Browning in his poem, Pippeth Passes, says, God's in his heaven and all's right with the world. Christian knows that's a lie. God's in his heaven, but all's not right with the world. The very interesting thing is, Joel says, how do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flock of sheep are made desolate. And there are those that have called our attention to the fact, and I'm sure you recognize it, that nature sings in a minor key. Have you ever been in the mountains and at night you listen to the wind blowing through the pine trees? That's a sad song. How mournful it is. And then have you stood at the seashore and listened to the waves break on the shore? There's a sob in the breaking of those waves. And we're told that the music of trees have actually been recorded. It's doleful. And then out yonder in the forest, you hear the startled cry of some frightened animal, a bird that pierces the night air, chills the blood. Nature bears audible testimony to the accuracy of Scripture. Godet quotes Schelling in this connection. Here's a quotation. Nature with its melancholic chorus resembles a bride who at the very moment when she's fully attired for the marriage saw the bridegroom die. She still stands with a fresh crown and in her bridal dress, but her eyes are full of tears. End of quotation. What a picture of nature today. Nature's groaning and that's accurate. Now we come to another new section, the new body. The groaning body we have now in the redeemed body. And we read, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Now, not only does nature groan, but the believers in harmony with nature. And I think this is the most devastating verse to those that promise the theory that the mark of a Christian is a perennial smiling face that you go around like a Pollyanna glad girl or goody goody gumdrop and look like a Cheshire cat all the time. They contend this crowd that a Christian should be a cross between a Cheshire cat and a house to house salesman. A Christian should grin at all times. Smile your troubles away is good for Rotary, but it's not the Christian method, by the way, friends. We groan within these bodies. Several years ago, when I began to move into middle age, why, I would come down of a morning from my room. And when I'd come down the steps, I was groaning because I didn't realize 
your knee is gonna hurt. So, and so I would groan. My wife told me I ought not to groan. I told her it's scriptural to groan because Paul, you know, says in 2 Corinthians 5, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. And the psalmist says in Psalm 6, 6, I'm weary with my groaning all the night. Make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. And I say to you that the Lord Jesus did some weeping also. I think he was a joyful person. At times that he wept. And these old bodies, they are groaning bodies. And I tell my wife, I want to be scriptural. So I groan. I guess I do quite a bit of it. Now, verse 24. For we are saved by hope, but hope that seems not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? In other words, we've been saved, and now we look forward to this. We have not realized it yet, but we are going to realize it someday. You see, faith, hope, and love are the vital parts of the believer's life. There'd be no hope if all were realized. Someday, hope will pass away in realization. In fact, both faith and hope will pass away in the glory which shall be revealed in us. Only love abides. We have a new body in the tomb, and we have a new one that's coming up someday. I wonder. Now, Paul goes on to say, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And I understand years ago, the late Dr. A.C. Gabeline was speaking, and he had a very enthusiastic member of the congregation, and he kept saying, Amen. And that annoyed Dr. Gabeline finally told him, he said, Brother, he said that the Scripture says that the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. So he says, don't utter them if it's the Spirit of God. And so we find today that we don't even know how we ought to pray, but the Spirit of God will make intercession with groanings that cannot be uttered. Have you gone to God sometimes in prayer? You actually did not know what to pray for. All you could do is just go to him and say, Father. And that's about all you can say. You couldn't Ask for anything because you didn't know what to ask for. There are many times like that, that we go to him in prayer. The Spirit helpeth our infirmities. How wonderful that is. Now, verse 27, and he says, He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now, if I go to God in prayer and say, Look, Lord, I want you to do it this way. That's one thing. I may not get the answer the way I pray it. But it's wonderful sometimes to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't know what to ask for. I don't know what to say, but I'm coming to you as your child, and I want your will done. And the Spirit of God then will make intercession for us according to the will of God. My, again, how wonderful that is. Now we have here the new purpose of God, and we come to well, let's put it like this. If Romans is the great book of the Bible and Romans 8 is the high water mark, then we come to that little pinnacle that Spinner talked about and that little shining point, and that's Romans 8, 28. Now, God's purpose, therefore, guarantees the salvation of sinners. And we have in this next three verses the ascending process of salvation. That's the way Sandy put it. Now, let me give you my translation. But we know, that is with divine knowledge, that for those who love God, all things are working together for good, even to them who are called ones according to his purpose. The late Dr. Tari, I had the privilege of being pastor for 21 years of the church that he founded. And he was a great man of God, greatly abused, misunderstood. And he knew the meaning of this verse. He called this verse a soft pillar for a tired heart. Many of us have pillowed our head on Romans 8, 28. We know the whole creation's groaning 
But we also know something else, that all things are working together for good, even the groaning friends. And that word we know is used five times in Romans, and know is used 13 times. And it refers to that which is the common knowledge of Christians, that is, which the Holy Spirit maketh real. Knowledge puffeth up, but love edifieth. But this is the knowledge that only the Spirit of God can make real to us. For we know these things because of that. Now, Spurgeon used to put it like this. He says, I do not need anyone to tell me how honey tastes. I know. And I say to you today, I know that God loves me. Know it. I don't need to argue that point. And it says, for those, though, who love God. Now, that's the fraternity pen of the believer. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. No badge, but faith which worketh by love. Love is the mark. Now, John puts it like this. In 1 John 4.10, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. Sent his Son to be the propitiation, the mercy seat for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us. His love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his Spirit We've seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, whoso shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God. God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. And my friend, you're going to have trouble believing that God loves you and you love God if you're hating your fellow man, that is, if you're hating other Christians, we love him because he first loved us. And Peter says, whom having not seen ye love, and whom though ye see him not, yet believing we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. The thing that will bring joy into your life and brightness is the fact that we love God. And if you know you love him today, and all things are working together. Now, that's all things. That means good things, bad things, bright things, dark things, sweet things, bitter things, easy things, hard things, happy things, sad things, prosperity and poverty, health and sickness, calm and storm, comfort and suffering, life and death. They're all working. They're all working. And this is causative. It means that God is working all things. There are no accidents. You remember Joseph could look back over his life, that life that had been filled with vicissitudes, disappointments, suffering, and he could say to his brethren, and they were responsible for his misfortune. He said to them, Ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. I'm confident that for your life and my life as a child of God, we'll be able to look back over it someday and say, all of this worked out for good. Job could say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's the kind of faith we need in God, friend, that we are not time servers, but that we know that he is going to make things work out because he's the one motivating it. He is the one that's energizing it, and it's going to work out because he's the one back of it. Jeremiah could cry out, though, why did you let me see trouble? And that's the cry of many of us today. It was during the San Francisco earthquake years ago that a saint of God walked out into that scene of debris and destruction and look upon it and smile. And a friend says, how can you smile at a time like this? And this party said, I rejoice that I have a God that can shake the world. My, how wonderful it is to be able to face life and to face death. Paul could face death unafraid. 
He says, what mean ye to weep and to break my heart? I'm ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Many of us would like to come to that place of total commitment to him. And this is for those that are the call ones, and it's according to his purpose. And may I say to you, this is something that it's hard for a great many people to swallow. The called are those that not only have received an invitation, they've accepted it, and they were born from above, and they know experimentally the love of God. Paul describes three groups of people. I think they are the three groups that are in the world today. He describes them in 1 Corinthians 1, 23 and 24. He says, but we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness, but under them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now here are the three groups. The Jews trusted in religion, rite, and ritual. To them the cross was a stumbling block. And the Greeks, or the Gentiles, they trusted in philosophy and human wisdom. And to them the cross was foolishness. But the called, they were another group. And they came out of both Jews and Greeks. And they were chosen not because of their religion or their wisdom or their superiority, God called them. And to them the cross was the dynamite of God under salvation. The call heard God's call. That's important. Let me go back to my illustration of the turtle. Suppose you go down to a mud puddle, and there are ten turtles in that mud puddle, and you say to the ten turtles, I'd like to teach you to fly. Nine of them say, we're not interested. We're turtle. We like it down here. Like the mud. Like this area. Like the environment. One turtle said, yes, I'd like to fly. That's the one that's called. And that one's taught to fly. Now, that doesn't have anything in the world to do with the other turtles. They are turtles because they are turtle. The lost are lost. They want it that way. There's not a person on top side of this world is being forced to be lost. They are those that they've chosen that. The boy down in my Southland years ago wanted to join the church. And the deacons, they were examining him. And they said, how'd you get saved? He said, God did his part and I did my part. And they thought they had him. And they said, what was God's part and what was your part? Well, he says, God's part was the saving. He said, my part was the sinning. He says, I done run from him as fast as my sinful heart and rebellious legs would take me. And he says, he done took out after me till he run me down. My friend, that's the way I got saved. Is that the way you got saved? That's the way that it happened. Now, this does not disturb or destroy the fact that whosoever will may come. You can come, whosoever believeth will be saved. And reward Beecher put it in this unusual way. He said, the elect are the whosoever wills, and the non-elect are the whosoever wants. And it's all according to his purpose. And my friend, if you have not yet got your mind reconciled to God's purpose and God's will, it's time you're doing that because this is his universe. He made it. I don't know why he made round worlds. Why didn't he make square ones? He never asked me about it. He made them round because that's the way he wanted them. My friend, may I say his purpose is going to be carried out, and he has the wisdom and the power to carry it out. Whatever my God does is right. Don't you say today God has no right to do that. He has a right, and when he does it, he is right in doing it. He's just He's loving anything that my God does. Now, there was a great theologian of the past by the name of Simeon. He said that he always preached on Romans 8 for three reasons. Because it laid the axe at the root of pride, and it laid the axe at the root of presumption. And 
also the third at the root of despair. And that's the reason he preached the doctrine of election. Believe me, friends, you'll never be able to pat yourself on the back and say, I did it. What a smart little boy I am. Who was that in the Mother Goose ride? The little Jack Horner sat in the corner eating pie, I think. He reached in his thumb, pulled out a plum, and he said, what a smart boy am I. <laughs> oh, we got a lot of church members like little Jack Horner. And they're sitting in the corner doing practically nothing except just reaching in the pie and pulling out a plum. And they think they're smart. Oh, my friend, may I say to you today, God's running all of this. This is his work. It's his wisdom. It's his purpose that's being carried out. And you and I better bow to it because I tell you, the will of God comes down out of eternity past like a great steam roller. Don't you think you can stop it? In fact, the matter is you better get on and ride. That's the way that he's running things. This is tremendous, let me tell you. Now, we need to read the next verse. It goes with it, by the way. For whom he foreknew, he also foreordained to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And let me read on. All of this goes together. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, or whom he foreordained, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, we're not talking about here anybody being elected to be lost, because the ones that he's talking about here happen to be the ones he mentioned in verse 28. We know that all things work together to them that love God. And the ones that are predestinated, and predestination never has any reference to the lost. You'll never find it used in connection with them. And if anybody begins to talk about this man is predestined to be lost, you're not being scriptural. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible does say that when God saves you, that he's going to see you through. And it means just simply this. Whom he foreknew, he predestinated. And whom he predestinated, he called. And whom he called, he justified. And whom he justified, he glorified. And this is amazing. This is a section on sanctification. And he doesn't even mention being sanctified. Why? Because that's a work of God in the heart and life of the believer. This here is God's eternal purpose and it just simply means this, friend, that when the Lord, who is the great shepherd of the sheep, and he's the good shepherd of the sheep, and he's the chief shepherd of the sheep, when he starts out with 100 sheep, he's going to come through with 100 sheep. When he starts out with 100 sheep, why, he's not going to lose one of them. Remember, our Lord gave a parable about that. There was a shepherd, a good shepherd, and that's God. That's the Lord Jesus. And one little old sheep got away, <laughs> got lost. And he might say, well, let him go. We got 99. They were safe in the fold. That's a good percentage. Anyone knows raising sheep that you don't come through with 99%. If you have a little over 50% of those that are born, you're going to do well, friends, and to get that many to market. But this is an unusual shepherd. He's not satisfied. 99, whom he called, whom he justified. If he justifies 100 sheep, he's going to glorify 100 sheep because when that little old sheep gets lost, he's going out after him because he's coming through with 100 sheep. It'll be like this someday, and I'll make this rather personal. Someday he'll be counting them in. One, two, three, four, five. That'll be all of you folks. And 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 99, 99. Where in the world is Vernon McGee? <laughs> and then he said, well, looks like he didn't make it. Well, we'll let him go. Because a great many people didn't think he was going to make it anyway. We just let him go. My friend, thank God he won't let him go. Because that shepherd says, if he does get out, I'm going to go after him. And I'm going to have a hundred sheep, and that's all this means here. This is not a frightful doctrine. This is a wonderful doctrine. That means Vernon McGee's going to be there. 
And it means you're going to be there, my friend, if you've trusted him. He's a great shepherd, by the way. Don't tell me this is a terrifying doctrine. It's the most comfortable doctrine I know anything about in these uncertain days in which we live. He goes on here to say something else. Verse 31, what shall we then say to these things? And my answer to that is this, what can you say? I haven't anything to add to this. This is too wonderful. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God's on your side, nobody can be against you, friend. Nobody will ever be able to bring a charge. Now he's specific with this. Notice what he says here, and he's given us the who's who here. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And how wonderful that is. He didn't spare his son. He spared Abraham's son, but not his. He gave his son to die for us. And he'll give us all things that we need. Somebody says, well, I may not be able to hold out. He's going to do that for you. He's going to hold you. The shepherd, you see, is the one who holds the sheep. And the sheep are safe, friends. It's not because they're smart sheep. Sheep are stupid. It's what a rancher told me in San Angelo, Texas. You raise sheep. He said, that's stupid. And they don't have sharp claws. They can't protect themselves. And they have no fangs. They're little old helpless animals. And if a little old sheep stands up and says, I'm safe, safe am I, is that sheep safe? Yes. Smart sheep? No, stupid. Well, why is the sheep safe? If that little sheep is safe, it's because he's got a wonderful shepherd. And my shepherd says I'm safe, friends. I'm just repeating him when he says all of this. He spared not his own son, but delivered him up. How shall he not with him also give us freely all things? And Dwight L. Moody used this illustration. He said if he went into the finest jewelry store in New York City and they brought out the loveliest diamond that was there and the owner said, that's yours. And he'd say, you don't mean you're giving me this most valuable diamond? He said, yes, it's yours. He said, now, if he gave it to me, I wouldn't hesitate to ask him for a piece of brown wrapping paper to wrap it up in to take it with me. May I say to you, if God gave his son to die for you, didn't spare his son, don't you know he's going to give you everything that's necessary in this life and the life to come? You can't ask for anything better than this, my friend. Now, will you notice verse 33? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Who's going to lay anything to the charge of God's elect? You can't bring any charge against them. And you know why? Well, the reason is this. Now, this is the beginning of the who's who. Who? Well, the reason is this. Who is he that condemneth? God has placed his throne back of his elect. They're justified sinner. God's back of them. But who's going to condemn? Nobody can condemn. You know why? It's Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. You see, you have four things he's done for he died for us, he's raised for us, delivered for our offenses, raised for our justification, but that's not all. He's even at the right hand of God. He's up there right now, friends. I don't care where you are, who you are, how you are, he sees you right now. He's the living Christ. You need him? Why don't you go to him? Why don't you appeal to him? He's the living Christ. And he also maketh intercession for us. Did you pray for yourself this morning? And you ought to. We ought to pray for ourselves. Well, if you missed it, he didn't. He prayed for you. He makes intercession. This morning, he said, Lord, there goes that fellow McGee again. And he'll stump his toe if we're not careful. And so watch over him. He watches over. Wonderful, isn't it not? These are four things, and you know this is the reason that you can't lay anything to the charge of God's elect because of what he's done for us. Four things Christ has done for us. Now we are told here's something else that's quite wonderful. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now who's going to separate us from the love of Christ? 
And he mentions everything that you can think of here. He says, shall tribulation, that's trouble. Is it possible that trouble will separate us? No, my friend. Trouble is not going to separate us because he's not going to let it. And distress, here's anguish. Oh, you may think God has let you down, but my friend, he hasn't. And distress will not separate you from him. Persecution, it means actually legal persecution. It means that there are those today that are carrying on a campaign against you. And that's not going to separate you from the love of Christ. And famine and nakedness and peril and sowing. That's a brief biography of Paul's life, by the way. None of these things can separate you from him. Now, listen to him. He says, as it is written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. And you know, Paul is quoting actually from Psalm 44, 22 here. He says, yea, this is the psalm now. Yea, for thy sake are we killed all the day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Now, this is a frightful picture of the saints in this day of grace. Is it true? We believe, I believe with all my heart, that this is the attitude of a satanic system toward the child of God, even in this hour. And I think the history of the church reveals that this is true. You stand for God today, and it'll cost you something. I worked as a boy in an abattoir. That is, the Swift Packing Company bought this place as a slaughterhouse for cattle. We kill cattle, sheep, and hogs. The first day to me was the most sickening experience I ever had. We killed about 100 sheep there. My job was to work right next to the man that took a sharp knife and cut the little sheep's throat. And to see animals slaughtered by the hundreds, to me, was a frightful spectacle. And I got so sick, I had to go outside, sit down in the air. The superintendent was a friend of my family's, and I just a kid, I was about 15 years old, and he told me to go outside and sit down because he knew what generally happened to a new person that came in there to work. My friend, I thought of that. It's sickening today to see what's happening to some of the saints of God, and they today are enduring this, and he says that we're going to be that way, but this won't separate you from the love of God. Nay, in all these things, we're more than conquerors, through him that loved them. Now, how can a sheep for the slaughter be more than a conqueror? And this is another wonderful paradox of the Christian faith. What does it mean to be more than a conqueror? It means to have assistance from another who gets the victory for us and never lets us be defeated because he gets the victory. The victory belongs to Christ and not to us. The victorious life is not our life. It's his life. Now he says, I'm persuaded. That means he knows that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come are going to be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And notice now some of the things he mentions, death. Death can't separate us from it. In fact, it'll take us into his presence. That's what Chrysostom said when the emperor tried to frighten him. He said, I'll put you to death. And he says, I'll thank you for it because you're going to transport me right into the presence of the Savior. It hurt a man like that. And life, life won't separate. Actually, friends, if he took us out of the world right immediately and he took me right now, it'd be great. But the interesting thing is that it's more difficult to face life than it is to face death. Face life with its temptations, failures, disappointments, uncertainties, and suffering. But that won't separate us from the love of God that's in Christ. And angels can't. And I think he means fallen angels. And principalities, these are spiritual enemies and powers I don't have time to go into all of that. Things present, that means present circumstances, things to come, that refers to the future. Nothing in the future, friends, and neither height nor depth, 
That's the space age in which we live. I don't want to travel in space. But you say he put our sins as far as the east is from the west, and the sinner will be separated from God. That's a second death. That's spiritual death. That's eternal death. But you see, he's put our sins way out, Chundi, but not us. And space can't separate us from it. And he says here, nor any other created thing, anything you want to mention, can ever separate us from the love of God, and that love is centered in Christ. 